As a representative of the government of uh, Catalonia to the European Union, I'm pleased to welcome you to this event, which is... Ah, so is, the connection is... Is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah. So, which is organized by the uh, Catalan Ministry for uh, Foreign Action an open government in the context of the monographic dossier that is that its magazine Ideas devotes to Africa and in the run-up of the SETS European Union Africa Union Summit. After a two-year delay due to the pandemic, tomorrow's summit will be a defining moment for the intercontinental relations with, with Africa and Europe. Leaders from both continents will discuss common challenges and agree on joint priorities for the Europe-Africa partnership. Given to the importance of this summit, the aim of today's event is to provide further elements of reflection and first hand experiences to some of the key priorities in the Europe Africa relations. To do so, this event will have two roundtables. The first one will gather think tank from both continents to address issues such as the green and digital transition, Hello. sustainable Hello. development Hello. and growth, and Hello. mobility. And after a coffee break, the second one will bring together public and private, private actors from Catalonia who will share their economic cooperation experiences in Africa. The format, as you know, of the event will have some speakers connecting online while others will be present. Both will be available live in the YouTube channel of our ministry. And now, before moving on the first round table, I would like to give the floor to the Catalan Minister for Foreign Action and Open Government, Mrs. Victoria Alsina, for the introductory remarks. Estimats amics, dear friends, it's for me a pleasure to welcome you all in such an interesting and timely event on behalf of the government of Catalonia. First of all, let me thank the organizers for making uh, these roundtables possible and also to the participants for accepting this invitation to be here with us today. I would also like to thank the attendees in person and those, like it happened these days, who are watching us online. We are excited because in just a few hours, the leaders of the European Union and the African Union will meet in Brussels to discuss their common challenges and to agree on a renewed partnership. In a globalized world that grows increasingly interdependent, multilateral forums like this summit are imperative. European and African governments have to make an effort to align their priorities, identify areas of mutual interest, and reinforce their economic development and trade agenda. Europe and Africa are not only neighbors, but also two natural partners well equipped to address the most pressing issues of our times. Two continents bound by history and by a common future. There is no time to lose. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been so devastating that for the very first time in a generation, we are witnessing and settling reversals in global poverty and inequality especially in the African continent. According to different reports, uh, indeed, most sustainable development goals are also experiencing a serious setbacks. Europe has to be sensitive towards African needs and demands because African countries are at different stages of development compared to Europe. We, as Europeans, have the responsibility to close the gap and boost the African recovery in a fair and equitable way. A recovery that has to be sustainable, green, digital, inclusive, and putting women and younger generations at the core, 
and fostering African productive capabilities. In my opinion, this summit is also a unique opportunity to speak up. It seems clear to everyone that Europe and Africa disagree very often on different topics. To just name a few, migration and mobility, security threats and defense, trade and market taxes, commodities and raw material exports, state and institutional building or human rights and democracy. This confrontation of arguments can be sometimes uh, rough, I know, but it's time to grab the bull by the horns. I know it will not be easy because Africa is sometimes the battleground of fierce political competitions, but let me be positive here. I'm very confident that there is enough room for improvement and that European and African decision makers will take advantage of this occasion. I strongly believe that this summit will pave the way for a closer and fruitful collaboration between Europe and Africa. Let me finish my remarks by talking about Catalonia. Due to its geopolitical location, Catalonia is committed to both African and Mediterranean strategies. In that regard, Catalonia symbolizes a bridge that connects the two continents. Today's event, indeed, on the eve of the European Union and African Union Summit is a very clear example of that. The Catalan government pushes for a shared prosperity model because the relationship between Africa and Europe is not a zero-sum game. Our assumption is that everybody wins if we as partners unite in diversity. Catalonia will be at the forefront when it comes to doing business and, uh, for example, promoting development projects and cooperation across African countries to the benefit of their citizens. I hope these roundtables will uh, shed light not only on the main challenges on the path towards cooperation and solidarity, but also on the windows of opportunity that we have together. Thank you very much for your attention and for your participation in this event. Thanks to Honorable Mrs. Alcina, Minister. And then let me say that due to a last minute uh, problem, we will not have with, with us Mr. Man Mano Neyes, which is the director of CETC. Uh, but uh, in, uh, it, it was uh, announced as moderator of the first round table. But anyway, he will now address us in a few words. Mr. Manoneyes, please. Good afternoon, Gorka. Good afternoon from Barcelona. Good afternoon to Brussels, but also to good afternoon to Rabat and to Pretoria. And good afternoon to everybody who is either in the delegation or connected and connected uh, and following uh, this panel discussion of today. My apologies for not being here. I mean, Brussels, as it was expected, but personal and logistical matters related to the current state of pre post pandemic, let's hope the post increase context uh, have impeded me traveling uh, today. Nevertheless, today we have what I consider to be a very interesting seminar and panel to discuss and share visions of what, again, I think will be a very relevant gathering, that of the sixth European Union African Union Summit that will take place tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, here, I mean there, in Brussels. To this respect, as director of the Center for Contemporary Studies, an in-house think tank of the Catalan government, I would like to thank all those who have made today's uh, session possible. Starting from the delegation of the Catalan government in Brussels, which is hosting it, to the different panelists who have accepted to participate in it, both in its first session and the second one, to Axio, the Catalan Agency for Business Co Competitiveness, that will be in charge of the following session, and of course to the personnel of the above mentioned institutions, but also from the Directorate for Foreign Action of the Catalan government, as well as from the Center for Contemporary Studies. Last but not least, my thanks to Oscar Mateos, Associate Professor of International Relations at Blanquerna School of the Ramon Llull University in Barcelona, 
who has been the coordinator of the monographic number of our magazine Ideas on Africa, which is at the base of the session of today. As already mentioned, we are now addressing the first roundtable of today's seminar, the one under the title Advancing Africa-Europe Prosperity Through the Win Twin Transitions, the African Continental Free Trade Area and the Demographic Dividend. To this, we have gathered a very interesting group of experts from different think tanks, or think and do tanks, as we say today, which I think provide us a polyedric approach to first the diversity of African reality and second to the also multifaceted relationship between Africa and Europe. We have the pleasure of counting with uh, on the one side Holly Ranai Vozanani, Head of Outreach, Advocacy and Partnerships for the Africa Europe Foundation, which as you know is a relatively recent initiative by among others the leading European think tank Friends of Europe and a leading African foundation, Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which is based in Brussels, I mean the Africa Europe Foundation. We also have Rogel Vignana, Managing Director of the European Institute of the Mediterranean, which is the leading think tank on Euro Mediterranean affairs and which is based in Barcelona. We also count with uh, Desigen Naidu, Senior Research Associate in the African Futures and Innovation Program of the Institute for Security Studies, ISS, also an important think tank based in Pretoria, South Africa, and he will be also with us uh, connecting directly from Pretoria. And we have uh, Larabi Jaidi, Senior Fellow at the Policy Center for the New South, a renowned uh, think tank based in Rabat, who is also connected uh, from uh, Rabat. We also have the pleasure to count uh, uh, present in Brussels, Vivian Ogo, who is the founder and president of La Puerta de Africa, a thing and do tank and a youth association based in Barcelona. If I'm not wrong, Vivian is in Brussels today since she's expected to participate in some of the sessions of the AUEU summit starting tomorrow. The moderator, since it's not going to be me because I'm I will be in the session connected, but we thought it would be more practical to have someone in, in, the, in the delegation in, uh, in Brussels will be uh, Oscar Mateos, who, as I mentioned, is Associate Professor of International Relations at the Blanquerna School of the Ramon Llull University in Barcelona, and who has been the coordinator of the monographic number of our magazine Ideas on Africa, which, as I said before, is the base of the session of today. The idea of this session is to discuss on the opportunities that arise within the Africa-EU partnership to promote a sustainable economic development that creates jobs, develops skills, and capitalizes on Africa's demographic dividend to provide durable solutions to challenges related to migration and mobility. Again, thank you, you to all for being here, either presentially in Brussels or connected uh, through different spots of the world to be here with us. And I hand over to Oscar Mateos to start the debate, which I'm sure it will be most enriching. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel Manuelis. And I have no job because uh, having been presented the, or mentioned at the round table and introduced the, the speaker, I only, uh, We'll give the floor to Oscar Mateos to conduct and moderate the first roundtable. Sorry, now it's working. Thank you very much. I was saying good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending this, I think, very timely event. Um, I would like to thank the CAT and the delegation, uh, the head of the delegation, Mr. Gorkanor, and all the staff for organizing this, and all uh, the staff also at IDEAS, uh, Centro de Estudis de Temas Contemporanes, the its director, 
Manuel Manuneyes, uh, Guillem Velasco, and the rest of the staff also for setting up everything. I was saying that I think this is a timely event. Um, I think this is a historic summit that uh, we were all waiting for. And that, of course, it's taking a stock of the experience of 20 years of, uh, more than 20 years of interaction between Africa and Europe. But I would say, we were discussing previously to the start of the session that um, this particular summit puts at the forefront, right, the idea of a balanced partnership, which I think is a key uh, for a successful outcome in this, uh, in this particular, like, summit. Uh, I would say that this is something, especially that from the Abidjan Declaration in 2017, in the fifth summit, was something that was especially uh, praised. Um, and that assumes that the Euro-African like interaction uh, is need to be built up with Africa and no, not uh, for Africa or on Africa. I will quote the Abidjan Declaration when it says, based on mutually beneficial partnership in the spirit of shared ownership, responsibility, reciprocity, respect, and mutual accountability and transparency. I think this um, summit also takes in a uh, like traumatic global context that is affecting worldwide, both Europe and African uh, countries. They are all both sharing the same type of global challenges, global inequality, the, the crisis of democracy, and of course, climate crisis. And I think the summit is also taking place, place in a context uh, where the African Regional Integration Project has moved forward despite of uh, all the problems and has taken shape in various important like frameworks and instruments that we for sure are gonna uh, discuss here uh, this afternoon, which is for instance the Agenda 2063 or the African Peace and Security Architecture or other like uh, instruments. This is precisely one of the ideas, one of the topics that we have been addressing in our monograph of uh, the magazine Ideas uh, that in fact was, uh, um, it, in the editorial, was highlighting this idea that Africa can no longer uh, be conceived as a peripheral territory in geopolitica, geopolitics and international relations, but at the century stage, in fact, of a global changing reality. I think the monograph captures most of these debates, discussions that are taking worldwide about the future um, present challenges of Africa and Europe, and I think that includes um, very top uh, authors' contributions that gives and provide with a lot of uh, interesting insights. Some of these questions are precisely the ones we want to address with these uh, speakers at this table. Uh, having already introduced the five speakers by the director of the Center for Contemporary Studies, Manuel Manuneyes, and acknowledging that this particular like topic is very broad and complex, as uh, almost everything, we would first like to ask each of you, uh, in no more than five minutes each, your expectations for this particular historic summit and which aspects, especially regarding the, the twin transitions, the ecological and the digital transitions, will be key to the negotiation of this new intercontinental framework. We can follow like the outline of the program, starting by Ms. Holly Ranai Bozanani. We will continue with Mr. Rugiel Vignana, with Mr. Desigen Naidu, Mr. Larabi Jaidi, and we will finish with Ms. Vivian Ugu. So you have five minutes each to give us this first uh, like set of impressions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and also uh, thank you for setting up the stage. So I would just start by saying that definitely there is a growing appetite in kind of a renewed partnership between Africa and Europe. So we've been talking about this for almost decades now, but I think more than ever, we've seen that with the context of the pandemic and indeed the cri climate crisis that happens and affects all of us, we definitely need to think and do things differently. And of course, I think uh, you already mentioned a couple of topics 
topics that are of common interest between the two continents. And we're talking about, of course, migration and mobility. We're talking about climate and energy. We're talking about, as well, the vaccine access and equity. I think these are topics that need to be addressed once more between all the different stakeholders and also to make sure that we have actually a common understanding. So you mentioned, for instance, the issues around the climate and energy. We see that here in Europe, we're talking, of course, the EU Green Deal. We're talking about carbon neutrality. Well, in Africa, we're still discussing about how to have access to energy. Just as a fact, um, actually, more than 50% of the African population, which is more than 1.3 billion people, or not have, have access yet to uh, basically uh, basic energy. And this is an issue when we're already moving forward in terms of the thinking, uh, in terms of the carbon neutrality. So what would be uh, basically the common approach that we need to have and how we make sure as well that within that renewed partnership, we actually take into account the common priorities, the priorities of Africa, the current challenges that they have, because we do know the challenges. But right now, I think the main purpose is to look at the solutions and that is the key expectation from this summit when you look at the different investment package that will be announced when we look at the different projects and also the priorities area how does actually support the current priorities that africa has already laid out through the 20 uh, the vision 2060 uh, free framework for instance and how we can also leverage basically um the different benefits that are exist between the two continents so i think that's important that we change the narrative that we shifted, that we make sure that this is a real partnership of equals and that each continent has something to bring um, to each other. That's the first thing. The second point is also to make sure that um, we look at the voice of the youth. Um, I think we've been talking about all these different common issues, but we need also to see in terms of governance, in terms of leadership, in terms of who do we need to listen to, who can drive basically that change, and it's about the youth. I think um, what's very um, encouraging, especially during that summit, is there is a special place, and I'm happy to see uh, Ms. Ogu here next to me, given to the youth so that we can hear as well the ex expectations and how they see basically that partnership moving forward. And I think that's very important as well in this new way of thinking of, uh, of doing things. And the last point I think that you mentioned as well is to talk about this um, digital transformation. So you mentioned about the green transition, but also how to couple that with digital transformation. I think Africa has been uh, at least on the forefront of um, the um, digital transformation. And we've seen examples, for instance, uh, around the boom of the fintech uh, in Africa. We've seen as well, for instance, how the mobile money, mobile payment has actually started uh, in Africa. So there is also this appetite for the continent in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, in terms of this youth uh, that drives innovation on the continent. And there is a lot of opportunities here to see how that could be tied as well with Europe, I think, long-term expertise in terms of innovation and in terms of best practices. And these are the type of opportunities that we need to put forward, that we need to also encourage to make sure that, again, there is an exchange of skills, exchange and creation of jobs as well through, uh, of course, the, the power, if I may say, of uh, this digital transformation and the power as well of being more connected. Because, as you know, um, having access to um, digital technologies and also making sure that they actually create what we call digital dividends, uh, social dividends as well, so that it creates jobs um, and also it sustains long-term economic growth. So there are definitely lots of opportunities. Um, what we would expect indeed is that within that is investment package that would be announced and will be discussed at the summit, within the, the different topics that will be also talked about that there is a clear action plan where actually we put at the center of table both African and European leaders, that we also put the youth at the heart of the conversations that, that we can move forward into a clear action plan that is will be actually driven by actions, by clear programs that they we can both basically reach uh, the vision 2063, but as well uh, the Iran Green Deal and the um, political ambitions from Europe. So. I think I will just uh, stop here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much uh, for sticking to the time as well. We'll continue with uh, Mr. Ruggie Albigiana, Managing Director of the European Institute of the Mediterranean. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. And allow me to, uh, first of all, to um, uh, express my gratitude to uh, 
the delegation, first of all, to host us uh, in this magnificent uh, premises, but also to the Center for uh, Contemporary Studies, if I pronounce it well, for the, uh, for the kind invitation and, and to the Directorate General for Foreign Affairs. Um, well, indeed, uh, I think that this, this conference is very, is very timely, only less than 24 hours uh, before the, the summit uh, kicks off. We can all hear uh, the noise of the official delegations running around the, um, in the uh, European headquarters, and I believe that we are truly at a very important juncture. Um, Probably there is uh, a lot of external noise at the moment uh, due to all what is happening in the Eastern Partnership. Um, and I hope this external noise will, will not undermine the importance uh, for the EU to, to host uh, this sixth uh, EU African Union Summit that as Holly uh, and I think Oscar uh, were mentioning, we have been, uh, we have been waiting uh, for too long due to uh, other circumstances such as the such as the pandemic, uh, but I think the opportunity um, is there to reassert the partnership and to make the partnership as a partnership of of equals. These premises of the of the Catalan government are actually located very close to the Schumann Square, and the Schumann Square brings me to the Schumann Declaration. And in the Schumann Declaration in 1950, um, there was already uh, a statement uh, on one of the tasks that the future uh, European uh, economic communities were supposed to, uh, to undertake as to um, help develop uh, the African continent. So this Europe-Africa uh, partnership, even though it was not there, and even though at that time, and probably also the years uh, afterwards, uh, was earmarked by the process of decolonization, was already at the foundations of the, of the European project. And I think it is very important to, uh, to underline it. However, the modalities in which the EU has engaged, has intervened, has cooperated, and partnered with Africa have been very diverse. But I would say that we will all agree that they have been perceived as one-sided, as a donor-recipient uh, relationship with Africa. Of course, this trend is probably aggravated when we look at, the, uh, at what the EU member states have been doing bilaterally with many uh, African uh, countries. And I think that this is the paradigm that we need to change. And this is not something that we are going to change uh, in this summit, but we need to continue this path to change uh, this impression that this EU-Africa partnership is, um, is one-sided. And to this end, I believe that the uh, agenda that has been put forward uh, is, is the right uh, recipe, uh, because at least we see it on paper, we read it at the um, Commission and the High Representative Strategy towards Africa, released a couple of years ago, um, that we need to create this reciprocal uh, cooperation on key priority areas such as the green transition, energy access, digital transformation, sustainable growth uh, and jobs, security and good governance, migration and mobility. Well, this is on paper but we need to transpose this paper uh, into reality. But we cannot be blind. We cannot be blind to the reality in Africa. I mean, 60% of the African population, the 1.3 billion that Holly was referring to, are young people. That means that they are below 25, the age of 25 years old. And we need every year, we need to create 30 million uh, new jobs for new entrants uh, into, into the labor markets. And this is the priority. And this is how, this is the outcome of, this should be the outcome um, of this renewed partnership uh, EU-Africa. Uh, EU of course, uh, part of the EU cooperation has been channeled through uh, the regional economic communities, mainly the ECOWAS with Western Africa, the uh, SADAC uh, with the South Africa and the EAC with the Eastern Africa. 
I think that particularly these three uh, regional economic communities have actually fueled um, uh, integration uh, across the African continent. Let's not forget that Africa is very is a very disintegrated continent from uh, from many points of view, but particularly uh, from the um, uh, from the economic uh, integration points of view. Uh, and we should not forget either, because we are here at the uh, premises of the of the Catalan delegation uh, government, and the Catalan government has a priority to work also towards the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries, that many North African countries have turned their attention to, uh, to sub-Saharan Africa in the past, in the past five years, uh, uh, namely Morocco, I would say, uh, but also uh, Egypt and Algeria to, to a lesser uh, extent. In this regard, I believe that the Mediterranean region could play an essential role in bridging Europe and Africa and enhancing real partnership between the two continents in spite of a real absence of regional integration also uh, between the North, the North African uh, countries. Uh, to conclude uh, this, first, uh, this first part, because I think that we will have a second, a second question, I think uh, it, is, it is important to build this uh, reinforced uh, partnership, taking into account that between Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, there is also North Africa. North Africa is part uh, of Africa. But unlike the way Europe has uh, shortened the ties between uh, the European Union and the North African uh, countries, which has been uh, basically bilaterally, meaning European Union with each of the North African countries, I think that this time the European Union should really um, give priority to develop strategies that not only strengthen these bilateral ties, but that through this array of programs and policies, Africa also uh, gets more integrated uh, among itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will continue with uh, Mr. Desidien Naidu, Senior Research Associate in the African Futures and Innovation Program in one of the leading think tanks in, in Africa, the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, I think she is connected from, from Pretoria. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Desidien Naidu. And let me start off by thanking the Catalan delegation for creating this Catalan bridge, as the minister pointed out, to enable us to have this discussion. Uh, in my input uh, to begin, I'm, I'm only going to talk to four points, and some of it is reinforcing what has been said already. Uh, but let me start at this point, that this is a summit of two unions, and it is imperative that the outcome of the summit empowers the regional integration project in Africa. Africa, in its deliber deliberations of moving from the OAU to the AU in 2001, had a lot of case study work done on the European Union, and it has in many ways inspired the way we have organized the political architecture. And so we are looking forward to this, and we were encouraged by the fact that in the fifth summit, uh, it went from an EU-Africa summit into an AU-EU summit, and we want to maintain that plateau at a high level. But there are a few things that have happened in between that are giving us cause for concern, where the rise of the bilateral mechanism as a preferred mechanism, and this point has been made already, and this is something we need to address. The second point that I want to get into and quite specifically is the issue around a joint strategy for peace and security uh, cooperation. Now, from Africa's perspective, we want this to be within the African uh, framework, uh, the African peace and security architecture. And we think this is possible. We think that we have to move uh, ways down this uh, direction. But there is a note of concern here. The note of concern is the conversion of the African Peace Facility, the APF, into the European Peace Facility. While it brings an increase in budget and an increase in investment in peace security matters from a European Union perspective, the dedicated funding available to Africa falls away. And we think one of the important things that can happen in this summit 
is that the deliberations and hopefully the declaration as well will make it quite clear that African peace and security operations still is a priority for the European Union. A peaceful Africa is good for Africa, of course. It's also good for Europe and the rest of the world. The third point I want to raise is the issue about recovering from the pandemic. Now, all of the numbers we have seen, whether they're from the World Bank, whether they're from IMF, whether they're from Bloomberg, whether they're from the other economics think tanks are saying that we are on course to an unequal recovery from the global pandemic and that Africa is likely to be one of those laggards. We would want to see this partnership of these two unions empowering a much more robust recovery on the African side, empowering instruments like the African uh, continental free trade area and the promise that it brings around us actually getting to 2063 in a much more powerful way. And there are also some very important specifics associated with this recovery. Because the first part of the recovery is actually dealing with the pandemic in Africa. Africa is very low vaccinated currently. It has low numbers, but some of those low numbers are associated with the infrastructure around the reporting and the testing. So the issue associated with AVAT, the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team's work, says that we need to develop much more robust manufacturing capacity on the African continent around vaccines. Now, the European Union has been very guarded in its stance around the TRIPS waiver. This is something that is desperately needed on the African continent, desperately needed to organize for a higher health status and that higher health status will allow for that economic recovery to happen, would allow for us to have the kind of economic trajectory going to the future more powerfully and to empower those vulnerable groups that were pointed out earlier, the women, the disabled, the youth, into fruitful employment and livelihood creation on the back of that. And we think this is a really pivotal factor. The final issue that I want to raise in, in my first intervention is the issue around the global, the Green Deal, the European Green Deal. And, and the thing that we want to push actually quite strongly is that what we really need from the African continent is a road to green deal not the classical Green Deal, because we have to deal with the issue around energy access on the continent as part of our recovery, as part of the economic development, because we don't want to end up with a demographic burden on the back of being the youngest continent in the world. We want to have a demographic dividend for Africa and for all of Africa's partners. So it is critical that there has to be an appreciation that there is a development pathway on the African continent that has to deal firstly with its climate dilemma, this is a continent that sits on easily $10 trillion assets in fossil fuels, and there has to be a way to get around that, that we have to build up the infrastructure on the African continent around the greening, around a just transition. And we are very keen for the European Union to be a primary partner inside this domain. And some of our other partners have recently made expressions in that regard that are very encouraging on the African continent. For example, FOCAC in, in December uh, made some very important statements around this greening trajectory. And we are very keen that a very old partner of the African continent in the form of the EU is able to do not just the same, but a lot better. And so we are looking forward to that possibility. Thank you for the opportunity to offer this opening input, and I look forward to the discussion. at the Policy Center for the New South. Uh, he's uh, connected from Ramat. Uh, welcome and good afternoon, Mr. Larabi Jaidi. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, your invitation to participate uh, in the event, uh, which I trust uh, will unlight the challenges of uh, the summit. Uh, on the African side, uh, the approach of the summit is uh, really pragmatic. African countries argue that uh, the partnership must go beyond the meetings and political declarations to become uh, 
more involved in uh, concrete and tangible actions that uh, meet uh, the expectation of uh, citizens. And uh, the fundamental challenge of uh, Africa-Europe relations is to support African countries' effort to uh, embark on a path of economic emergence. Consensus must and can be reached between the, the two parties on uh, the adoption of a strategy to be deployed over the long, uh, long term through uh, successive reforms of institutions and organizations, but above all by uh, recognizing that Africa can build the foundations of uh, its autonomy through the diversification of, his, of uh, its activities and the reshaping of uh, Europe-Africa relations can be undertaken based, based on the, a variable geometry by, uh, by giving priority to sectorial, to sectoral uh, objectives that go uh, beyond national and geopolitical antagonism, water, energy, food, health, education, climate, uh, security, and uh, on several strategic subjects of interest to Europe. Variable geometry arrangements would allow uh, territorial interdependencies and regional common goods to be managed by uh, uh, mobilizing multiple actors. I mean uh, decentralized authorities, NGOs, companies, states, with the financial banking and uh, national governments. So, uh, to this end, priority to education, skills training, and uh, entrepreneurial education, unleashing uh, of energies and the development of a spirit of innovation, all point to education, to educational models that uh, ease constraints and allow for innovations to flourish through the empowerment, the empower, uh, empowerment of youth. Uh, it is also a matter of uh, stabilizing the environment and uh, securing goods and people to enable long-term prospects and uh, entrepreneurial risk talking. I think that, uh, as you know, current projections uh, on demographic uh, we, 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 we can uh, see that uh, we are in face of either a demographic dividend or demographic time bomb. And Africa could miss out of the dividend entirely or at the best make only a modest gain. On the negative side, the growing youth unemployment problem could be uh, a catalyst for uh, political instability. So to reap the demographic dividend, uh, African governments should accelerate programs in education and economic opportunities, and the uh, EU can assist the process with the resources and knowledge transfer. The fact of uh, that uh, aging population in Europe uh, raise a series of difficulty and of difficult policy issues at both the level of uh, the EU and its member states. So uh, a system of labor linkage managed migration will be needed to complete to complement internal inter, internal response to constraints within the European labor market and you you know that uh, migration has a significant effect 
on the send, sending countries also, not only uh, positive. When the most uh, able and better school leave uh, Africa in search of work and they diminish the pool of skills and the leadership available at home to build uh, a productive state. So uh, both Africa and uh, Europe have much to gain by collaborating around initiatives which plan for and support Africa's ability to harvest its uh, upcoming demographic dividend in a manner supportive of uh, both Africa's needs for job creation and skilled workers and Europe's need to augment labor force capabilities in response to imbalances in uh, its labor market, which are accepted to, to accelerate and deepen. Uh, and I think that uh, twin uh, transition can be uh, a fruitful area for cooperation because common interests and interdependence between uh, both continents are high. Green transitions have the potential to support Africa-Europe cooperation, but combining the climate agenda with uh, an innovative socio-economic project for jobs creation and sustainable growth. And uh, the EU and uh, the African Union approach green transition uh, from, very, are from very different angles. Uh, the EU has a major responsibility and continues to have very high per capita emissions. African countries have contributed little to climate change, but will be uh, severely affected by its consequences. So, uh, acknowledging these uh, differences, we need to be the starting point to identify for uh, identifying priorities for uh, cooperation on uh, developing green transition and uh, neither Europe and Africa now has uh, a blueprint for uh, what carbon neutral societies and economies will look like. So cooperation on green transition therefore provides an opportunities to join learning and join knowledge production by European and African actors and for some of the underlying structural asymmetries to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jaidi. We will finish this uh, first set of interventions with Ms. Uh, Viviano Wu, uh, President of La Puerta de Africa. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank the, the delegation for the organization of this. Um, event and especially thank Oscar for uh, trusting young voices. Um, as we started, um, we are in a moment in which, uh, an, a, in a historical moment, I would say, in which uh, there is a shift of the historical power relations. Um, I think, like this, is one of the most important, um, well, one of the key reasons this summit is so important. Uh, we are not only in the shift of the geopolitical. Um, power, but also in, in, in social and power relations and, and, and demographics. Um, well, I've been asked to address the, the role of the Agenda 2063 and the youth uh, within the summit. Um, I will try to go uh, fast through it. Um, please do not hesitate to cut me if it's, if it's necessary. So I will begin with the youth, and I would like to quote my colleague Gerard, an AG with whom I've been working this last week. Uh, and he said, um, we the youth of Africa are the 60% of the population. Why shall we listen to the adults if we are the majority? Um, I think this is a very, well, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point to understand like how young people is, is, under, is, is, is living um, is, is leaving the, um, the evolution of, 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 of politics and the role that they want to that they want to have in Africa, but also the role that we uh, want to have in, in Europe. Um, so when it comes to the summit, I think that like it's um, 
youth are, are a central topic that are being dealt. We are a central topic in, in the narrative. Um, the, the ministers that, um, and, and many um, interveners are putting youth in the center because, um, well, the African youth and, and the diaspora, uh, we are the workforce that have to develop Africa. Um, we are the migrants that are um, being part of this uh, narrative in Europe um, and, 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 and contributing to, to, the mo to a move to, towards um, the right wing. Um, we are also fighting in the different conflicts that are um, being um, having place in, in the continent. Uh, but we are also the entrepreneurs. We want also to be um, the peace builders. Um, so when we speak about EU-Africa relations, when we speak about um, how we're going to facilitate the progress of, of both continents. We are actually speaking about um, how we're going to facilitate that young people get the tools and have the capacities to um, address the challenges that are being held in Africa and that can build um, a, prosperous, a prosperous future. So I wanted to explain you a bit which is actually being the role of young people during the summit um, because we have had a place at the discussions. We're not probably having a place at um, the, the summit tomorrow and, and after that are starting tomorrow and after to, and it's going to um, um, last an, up until uh, Friday. But during like this uh, Africa Europe week, we have been working um, in joint um, propositions that um, two hours ago we presented in front of several ministers, commissioners, both from the African Union and the European Union. So um, many young organizations from both continents have come together and have debated during the last two and three weeks, first um, in, 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 with our constituencies and organizing um, debate space to um, highlight which are uh, for us the priorities and that we believe that um, leaders should be addressing um, during this summit. And we have come with a a uh, joint report that will be delivered uh, tomorrow to the to the leaders, and also it's going to be public, in which we um, have shared all of our intentions. Um, as I as I was saying two hours ago, we were debating it uh, with uh, some um, leaders, and they were all feeling uh, very passionate, very very excited um, to what we were saying. They were supporting, so. Even, of course, we young people are not going to have a political role because at the end, if we want to have a political role, we have to be in politics. We cannot just like appear and, and try to be heard because at the, also um, to be in this kind of spaces is, is a privilege and not all people um, comes here um, in a very democratic way, to say it so. So um, um, they, they re like, th there is like this uh, really interest into including people in the implementation of, of, of different um, projects and having um, our like having into account that, that there is a need for intergenerational um, collaboration. And to close, and I'm going to go very fast, uh, regarding the agenda 2063, I, um, I, I'm sure that most of you know what it is, but it's a development agenda of the African Union that uh, aims that for, in, like in the period of 50 years, it was signed in 2013. Um, the African Union is, uh, well, Africa is capable of developing uh, by itself. So, um, even the, the agenda is not in the narrative and we are not going to be hearing, um, a, a, we're not going to listen about it much. Uh, it's also the center of, of, of the conversations because when we speak about um, the financial package uh, for ensuring health and, and, and climate resilience, we are, for instance, speaking about the agenda. Uh, when we speak about transforming the uh, security and defense, uh, peace and security architecture to ensure stability, we are speaking about the agenda. But most important, and, and this I think will close what, what, what I, with what I started, is um, that the fact that Africa is today at the center of the geopolitical conversations, that we are seeing the shift, that we're seeing that Africa is gaining power, is its seventh aspiration, is the seventh aspiration of the um, uh, Agenda 2063, that Africa is a global player, a respected global player. So um, the summit itself and the, the, the historical moment when it comes um, is, is um, 
to say it somehow, well, we, we see how like the seven aspiration is, is um, being starting to be accomplished. And so, well, as I said, uh, we will probably lack the narrative of the agenda. Hopefully it will be included in the final declaration. And well, in, in conclusion, um, I think that, well, uh, the youth is having a central role, um, not in decision making, but yes, in the narrative that is being um, done and, and that, well, that we are building towards the, the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Ugu. Uh, I think many interesting ideas were raised in this first set of, of opinions. I uh, echoed some things um, that you mentioned, like the need of changing narratives, uh, the need of uh, praising the voice of the youth, the need of a balanced partnership, despite some of you mentioned uh, the problem of an equal recovery in the context of the, the pandemic. And you also mentioned, for instance, the idea of a respected, to be a respected global player. Let me just focus for the remaining 30 minutes that we have ahead. Um, in a second question um, that tries to also gather different aspects and important things that have happened in, in Africa. And I think we need to take in, into consideration to look at this specific topic we are addressing. On one hand, I think many things happened since the Cotonou Agreement in Africa. The refundation of the African Union, uh, many um, important uh, institutional instruments were built up in, in Africa. I think a booming uh, internal architecture is also, uh, has also been developed. So the regional integration of Africa has been, I mean, of course, with positive and negative aspects, but, but ha has been a reality. I would like you, on one hand, to look at this sp a specific topic, the challenges we have ahead in this sixth summit from all this work that from the regional integration like process has been made through what uh, has been already mentioned, the Agenda 2063, the African peace and security uh, architecture, uh, the African um, free trade area, uh, many things. So that is in, on one hand. But on the other, I think we, we need to mention also something that probably has like shape African realities in the last 10 years, which is uh, this uh, important social mobilizations that are taking place in many societies and that for sure are also shaping the negotiations and the interactions between society and their leaders and the leaders that are going to be here negotiating uh, the new agreement with, with, with Europe. To what extent the voice of societies, the voice of the populations that are like praising in the streets for more welfare uh, for their countries is also somehow integrated in the, into the negotiations that will take place in Brussels during this day. So from these two perspectives, take whatever you consider uh, from your own background and your own perspective, you can reflect on and help us um, to analyze a little bit. So we will start again with Ms. Uh, Ranai Bozananani. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, it's true there is so much that has been said already, and I think I will pick up some of the key points that different uh, speakers uh, mentioned um, already. I think the first point is to say why this partnership matters now. And you, and you mentioned about it, actually, uh, when you say that, yes, the citizens, the youth are so craving for it. So, of course, we need a political leadership. We need uh, a political willingness into having this renewed partnership. But at the end of the day, it's, of course, the voice of the citizens. And we at the Africa Europe Foundation, we actually um, organize a sort of um, survey, uh, mass survey, actually, towards uh, Africa and also Europe to try to understand what is the real needs uh, of the people today, of the citizens, and why it matters absolutely now. And that's, of course, uh, being exacerbated, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, with the context of the pandemic and as well of this, um, of course, climate crisis. But what is matters as well, and has been mentioned by the, the previous speakers, it's 
that Africa right now also needs that strategic autonomy. And what, um, what we need to see coming out of this summit is, of course, as one of the first priorities, is that recovery from the pandemic, but also to deal with the pandemic. And that strategic autonomy, definitely we need to start with, uh, for instance, these um, manufacturing facilities. We need to produce the vaccine, for instance, in Africa to be sure that the population, uh, which is now vaccinated at only 10 percent, we have a higher um, rate of, of course of being vaccinated so we can deal with um, this pandemic but then we also need to move forward and look forward so what's going to happen because there will probably going to be more pandemics in the future and that is also the reflection that we have at the foundation thinking of for instance the healthcare um, workforces of the future and here we're not talking about doctors we're not talking about nurses we're also trying to tie it with the digital transition so we may need data scientists for instance to predict our future um, let's say pandemic linked to the the really the renewed uh, workforce um, also the healthcare system so we're talking about all these uh, different issues that needs to be dealt now needs to have the right instruments the right frameworks that need to be put uh, in place so that we can address uh, basically future challenges as well because we know what happens now but that's where as well as terms of outcomes of this summit we need to move forward uh, and also to be really um, action oriented so I think that regional integration, talking about the frameworks that already exist, that are proven not to be that deficient. We definitely need further, uh, let's say, cooperation uh, and as well, uh, probably exchange of best practices between two continents to make sure that that makes uh, it happen, that we have a joint strategy, that we have common approaches, and again, that we actually uh, share and use uh, the different benefits and resources from both continents so really we can shape and re, uh, shift um, the narrative today. So I think that's very important dealing with this uh, strategic autonomy. And the second point I would like also to mention is the role of localization. So yes, we mentioned about the regional approach, but then we also need to look at the local approach, local cities approach. And I think that's very important as well to bring that on the table. So how different cities have in different approaches, uh, because as mentioned by my, uh, my peers here, here, they're definitely, uh, Africa is very different uh, from north to east, to east to west. So I think we also need to learn from these different best practices and also learning from Europe experience, what they can bring on the table to kind of provide these 30 million jobs that are missing every year today so that we can sustain, of course, that uh, recovery. So I, I would say that there are a lot of moving parts. Um, we all would like to see something that would change in the next couple of months, weeks. We at the foundation will definitely going to act as a monitoring mechanism post the summit to make sure that what has been announced would have a proper follow-up and then uh, we can also see what would be how we can assess basically the the feedback and um, of all these uh, different outcomes but what is important is that we need to walk to talk and talk to walk shape continue to shape that narrative put the youth at the center of the conversation and of course keep the the gates and the conversation open between the political leaders across africa and europe and of course last point is to make sure that that investment package are actually directed to the priority areas where we can have and i would say the biggest impact in the next couple of years. Thanks. Thank you, ver thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Abignana? We'll continue well, with you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, as I, as I said before, I, I think that one of the main challenges is how we, uh, how we spore this, uh, this regional integration, how the EU creates the uh, conditions and encourages African countries to integrate more uh, between themselves, because it is true that the, the the regional economic communities have been working so far. Not all of them. Um, I was now thinking when when my friend Laravi Jaidi uh, was speaking, I was thinking about the the Arab Maghreb Union, which, as you know, was created in 1989, and the Arab Maghreb Union is one of the regional economic economic communities that has not that has not worked. Um, but in a way, we have an opportunity now, and the EU has an opportunity now to do things differently and to try to create conditions and incentives for African countries to uh, better integrate among themselves, to spur uh, regional value chains, continental value chains. I think that, and to better, of course, insert into global value chains. 
I think that the African continental free trade area, of course, is, uh, is the path to follow. And it is there. I mean, we don't have yet the majority, I don't know how many countries have now ratified the, the, uh, the African continental free, tra free trade area, um, but we have to move from treaties, from documents into actions and into, into results so that we can see uh, development uh, in the continent. And, and to this end, I think the, uh, the EU has a, res a responsibility to uh, perhaps act differently. Second of all, well, I come from uh, the European Institute of the Mediterranean, and I said before, the Mediterranean region should act as a bridge between Europe and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that also means that the EU should, uh, should not articulate its cooperation with the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries in a dissociated manner uh, to, the, uh, to the cooperation uh, with, uh, with Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, it should establish uh, uh, concentric circles from which political dialogue can be fostered in juxtaposing fora in which EU programs and funding schemes can seek triangulation, EU, Mediterranean, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think we, we should not abandon that. In Barcelona, as you know, uh, we have the, uh, the premises of the Union for the Mediterranean, which, uh, which triggers political debate between the EU and the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean countries. Why not, not only to enhance the UFM, the Union for the Mediterranean, but also to encourage the UFM to have talks with the, uh, with the Commission of the African Union? Uh, in Ethiopia, so that, because nowadays we see issues like migration, climate change, uh, trade um, transport, that you cannot deal with them uh, in the Mediterranean separately from the, from the rest of the African continent. And this is something that we, we, need, to take, uh, we need to take into account. Third point, well, my understanding is that, of course, the, uh, with the new uh, instruments that the European Commission has put in place to, uh, uh, to promote and fund foreign action, uh, we are already going into a certain integration in DC and the, uh, uh, and the external investment plan. But I have the impression that the European Union institutions have been launching lots of instruments, programs, policies. Already from the time of, of, of Juncker as president of the European Commission, the external investment plan, then the pandemic comes and we have the Team Europe packet, then a couple of months ago, uh, the, the, um, uh, the global gateway. This is all fantastic. but. To me, it's hardly difficult to follow. <laughs> I don't understand the array of programs and policies that the EU is doing. It seems to me that the EU is trying to react towards what other uh, global players are doing in the, in the continent, in the region, rather than saying, well, this is my long-term vision for the partnership with Africa. I don't think that we have a long-term vision. I don't think Europe has a long-term vision, because if we had a long-term vision on how the cooperation between the EU and Africa should look like, we would have to talk about human mobility. I mean, human mobility is a very key topic. We would have to talk about agriculture. Well, agriculture is a very important, it's a very important sector uh, for, for African economies. And I see in these two particular areas, which I think that are key uh, to, to, to foster EU-Africa uh, cooperation, I see more rhetoric than facts. And I finish by quoting a close friend of mine, uh, I will not disclose his name or her name, but who sits very high in the uh, Commission of the African Union. I had a conversation with him or her um, three weeks ago, and he told me, Roger, I don't understand. I mean, he is in the. Uh, he of course lives in in Addis Abeba in in Ethiopia, and he told me, "Well, I understand what the Chinese want to do in Africa, but I don't understand what the Europeans want to do in Africa." Thank you. Thank you very much. Very stimulating this la last uh, thought. Uh, we will con continue with Mr. Desijin uh, Naidu from Pretoria. 
very much, Chair. Uh, those were fascinating points, uh, and I'd like to build on them. But first, uh, a note to, to Vivian. Vivian, you being around the table and the youth being around the table is not a privilege. It's a fundamental point of legitimacy because we are talking about not just youth as future leadership, Youth are in fact a fundamental part of current leadership. And I think we need to absorb that in a very real way. But a few further contributions to the debate. Firstly, I just wanna put it out there that as an African, this divide of sub-Saharan Africa from North Africa doesn't really help any of us. Uh, we don't talk about it in that way and we're not sure anymore what kind of purpose it serves. At some point in the past, it served a European purpose. Maybe it currently still does, but I should put it out there that we want to talk about Africa as a whole, that we have great diversity in Africa, absolutely. And we see the movements around that and that diversity happening all over the continent. We have countries that are still in the LDC domain, and we have other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that are knocking on the door of upper middle income status some countries not very far away from advanced economy status. So I just want to put that out there as, as in the way that we speak, uh, we have to reevaluate that. Three other points, and I will do this quickly. Firstly, is that the SDGs as a development accelerator for the continent and a removal of the possibility of a continued global burden by making sure that the SDGs are met in Africa soon after 2030, because 2030 itself is a very difficult target, is something that we put very high priority on and we would like our partners to have an equal prioritization around it. But SDGs in a very particular way, SDGs on the road to a low carbon economy, SDGs as a building block of the future economic prosperity of the continent. SDGs as an investment in that pathway to 2063, as opposed to a sunk cost in the short term. The next point that I want to make is that a high priority that is emerging on the African continent, and we haven't seen enough pronouncements on this from various of our partners, including Europe, is the climate development security nexus as a very fundamental point a fundamental texture of how we're wanting to develop policy on the continent. We've expressed this on the continent itself with the AU Peace and Security Council. We've expressed this in the United Nations Security Council uh, through our African members. It's something that I think should become a, an important banner under which we start engaging many of our development trajectories, our peace and security trajectories, our humanitarian trajectories, and of course, how we deal with the issues of climate change. And climate change is a high point on the agenda for 2022. And 2022, courtesy of Egypt, we will be having the what we are calling the Africa COP, whether that's a legitimate uh, uh, ownership or not. But it is an important year for Africa around climate and climate change. And we want this to be a very high priority with all of our partners, and especially you. Then the last point that I want to put out there is that the issue of Africa's global partnerships is in an encouraging space for Africa. You know, we, we have solid relationships with all the partners, like with the European Union and like the US, but also very new partnerships that look very promising with the likes of China, with the likes of Japan, with the likes of Turkey, with the likes of South Korea, with the likes... Uh, of India. And we're not yet at the place where we're coordinating that in a sufficient way. And this is not intended to put out there to our partners that there is a competition. I mean, we need these partnerships with the entire world, just as Europe has these partnerships with the entire world. And we need to organize ourselves in the way we have these bilateral discussions with a tacit understanding that that is the state of play. And sometimes I get the impression, often I get the impression that we don't, that we don't, that we talk about relationships in isolation. And the, we need to expand that view in a very serious way. In the same kind of way around the partnerships, uh, we need to be talking about the nature of the empowerment of the partnerships in Africa 
around two very particular issues. One is the development of the private sector in Africa. Now, Africa already has in excess of 148, by now, I think, knocking on 150 companies, African companies that are already multi-billion dollar companies and are in the realm of multinationals. Small number for a big continent. You know, it's only three times as many countries that there are on this continent. And we need to grow that, not just that number, but African business in a very significant way. And part of that is reorganizing for Africa's positioning in the global value chains. Because I can put it to you that one of Africa's primary anxieties is like the resources of this continent, the minerals, the oil and gas have been used to empower the industrial revolutions of the North. We have the anxiety that all of the new resources required to power up a renewable energy economy in the world might again leave Africa in the same place, that our resources once again will empower a northern and outside Africa revolution towards a greening of the world as a whole with more prosperity and high levels of economic development without Africa being a sufficient beneficiary of that. And so in the way we're engineering these arrangements, in the way we're negotiating these relationships, that is a very high priority on the African side. And I'm hopeful that by the end of the week, we'll see significant milestones around exactly that uh, in this declaration that will come out of the AU-EU summit. Let me pause right there. Thank you. Ten minutes uh, ahead, ten remaining minutes. I would uh, request the two pending like uh, panelists to be to stick to the time. So five minutes each in order to like finish uh, at the time that we uh, were expected. So Mr. Jaidi, please the floor is yours. Thank you. I think that uh, regional integration can uh, can. Uh, sidestep some uh, of the concerns that uh, countries individually face in the areas of uh, human capital and technology needed for uh, for development and uh, the proposed africa europe partnership is uh, an important tool to strengthen this effort with the support for regional integration and access to innovations needed for uh, green energy adoption or for uh, uh, human development and so. Uh, I think that uh, in this process of uh, integration, uh, domestic actors, I mean, uh, member states or uh, national governments in, in Africa have a role to play in uh, annealing their policy and uh, regulatory frameworks with uh, regional requirements, with uh, specific uh, interventions, including uh, to encourage uh, regional infrastructure linkage appropriate legal measure to encourage local and foreign entries into the green sector and so on. On the other hand, we, we have to be aware that uh, gains and burdens from uh, integrational, uh, integ integrative approach are not expected to be shared equitably between uh, all the countries in Africa and between all the population of Africa. So uh, a framework uh, for uh, compensating losers lo or the losers will be crucial to uh, ensure uh, large support or broader support to, to the process of integration. And I think that uh, uh, an assistance to ENGOs and social uh, civil societies in Africa is very, very important to, uh, 
to in the in the future. Uh, I think that um, the FTA in Africa is uh, is is uh, a unique opportunity for both Africa and the EU to deepen trade and to create a dynamic for uh, regional and global value change. So, uh, uh, in my opinion, it is important to, to have uh, uh, an approach for uh, supporting political dialogue, not only with the African Union, but equally with the, the members of uh, African Union, because uh, the relation between uh, uh, members of the uh, African Union and the institution are not very clear in the process of decision. Uh, and uh, I think also that uh, uh, the engagement of uh, the private sector and uh, the NGOs is uh, a very great challenge to uh, uh, to reinforce the dynamic in the future. Other aspect or other problem is about the EU trade policy. It is uh, uh, it had an, an impact on economic integration in Africa because uh, uh, the, the EU trade policy had. Uh, has had an impact on economic integration in Africa, trade arrangements. And uh, uh, we have to, to be aware that uh, to coordinate between uh, the framework of the global liberalization in the uh, continental free trade and the arrangement in the regional economic integration. Uh, it is sure that the technical tools of trade agreements are very important in, uh, in, in this dynamic. Uh, rule of origin, trade defense measures, and so on. But uh, what is important, in my opinion, is that uh, the EU still needs to be aware that African integration may take on a different trajectory that uh, the one of the EU has historically followed. Uh, the goal should not be to replicate the model or the EU model, but to provide a path of uh, African-led regional economic integration and uh, programs uh, regarding infrastructure development, industrialization, are uh, very particularly relevant for uh, the start of trade or for the development of uh, trade. Thank you for uh, your uh, attention. Thank you very much. And we'll finish finally the second round of thoughts with Ms. Bibiano Gu. Um, thank you. I'm going to try to react to some of the things that um, the other speakers said. First of all, to um, answering to Mr. Uh, Naido um, on regards to the privilege that is being here. Yes, it is a question of of um, recognizing the leadership of young persons. But today I was sitting um, next to the Italian minister and 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 other commissioners and and, and people that that uh, was listening to um, young people. Um, claiming for, for certain things. And me personally, I asked for meaningful and inclusive participation of youth, far youth farmers. I believe that are the youth farmers who should be uh, sitting and asking for themselves. And the reason why it was me is in part because I am from uh, the privileged Global North um, class, to say it somehow. So that's a bit like the reason why I'm talking about privileges, not because I don't recognize the important work that we young people try to do, at least, because we really believe in what, at the end, you adults uh, t um, taught us about like uh, global progress and etc. but because we, we also uh, want to ensure that uh, the, the world that we are creating, that all the uh, declarations that we are making, that uh, th this um, process is really inclusive and, and it not, not only for, for some of us. Um, and also, like, I wanted to, to comment on that, um, that this topic on that, like, the declarations are not, are not being fulfilled. 
from the youth perspective, uh, this is similar. Um, in fact, well, um, one of our uh, key messages today for for the for the leaders have been um, that there is an urgent need to deliver these, um, like the, the promises made in 2009 and 2017, for example, the delivery of uh, $100 billion um, in climate finance that are necessary because like, um, especially for example, farmers and people in rural areas are really having problems uh, coping with climate resilience. So like it, it's necessary. And the answer from, from especially the European ministers, because we, we directed this question to them, was that yes, that it was going to be fulfilled, that after the, the summit, um, um, well, we, we will see like the transfer. Uh, well, um, I actually was excited. Now then you, you get out and, and you think, well, <laughs> is that true or not? Um, but we'll, we'll see. Maybe this can really be a moment uh, for, for um, well, catching with the with the past commitments we've made. Um, regarding the the what what uh, Mr. Roger said um, that the EU does not have a plan. I have to say that the AU uh, neither has a plan for the European Union. So <laughs> this uh, um, lack of maybe direction is is shared. But um, I, I'm I'm of course I'm very young and I'm still I, I still need to read a lot and I still need to understand a lot. But I can explain what young people um, either if we are from Madagascar, if we are from the diaspora, or people that is interested in in global politics. Um, and generally say when we are together and, and, and is that the, like we speak about the colonization we speak about um, um, we, we, we are speaking about uh, transforming the global paradigm so I ask myself uh, what is going to happen if um, China, Russia, and all the emerging potencies that come um, get the share of market of France or other uh, member states of the European Union. Um, as I said, I'm very young. I, I, it's, I think it's a topic very uh, difficult to understand. But um, maybe this is what we are trying to fix, right? The, um, all, all these inequalities and all these um, historical power relations that at least um, to our generation, um, does, uh, we, we have the, the impression that are not fair enough. Um, then we, we, you were speaking, you were commented on, on, on regional integration, it's important in its priorities. Again, I'm gonna um, talk about the joint outcomes of the, of, of, of the youth track because um, I believe that we've done a strong uh, work here, so I, I will defend it. Um, the, young, the, the, the priorities of the young people is that, yes, we, we need this intercontinental uh, free, um, free trade area, um, but we are afraid, um, and we are afraid both Europeans and Africans and diaspora, we all agree on this, we are afraid that young people is not going to have access at the end to all this market, that all the entrepreneurs uh, that are um, that young entrepreneurs that have a lot of potential and are working very hard, for instance, in our organization, well, here's my secretary, um, in our organization, we have a, a youth uh, innovation lab where we bring together young emerging leaders from Africa and Europe. They are all entrepreneurs. There is such potential, but there is no funding. There is no possibility for us to be competitive. So this is our priority. We want to ensure that this free trade area is not going to be for the big fishes that already play and that have a lot of money already that, that are going to really serve to the populations and, and, and to the people that deserve to live with dignity. Um, oh, another uh, priority for us is uh, permanent political dialogue. Um, I think that something very beautiful about, and I'm, I'm going to finish because I don't want to extend much, but I think that something very beautiful about EU-Africa relations from, again, the youth perspective and, and how we speak about it and how we, 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 we think about it is that, um, said it in a not very professional way, we love each other. So even we, we have like this historical, um, th th this history that, that is um, difficult um, and, and, and that has to be addressed and that has to be acknowledged. Um, we really want to be um, team players. We really want to uh, work together. We are neighbors. Uh, we believe in the potential. We, we enjoy the, the, the time with each other. So we really want permanent structures, not only every two, three, four, five years in summits and declarations in which 
act, be, being fair, um, the, what is going to be signed is, is already uh, agreed. Like in two days, they're not going to agree with a lot of things, right? So we really want that this come, uh, is all the time with civil society, with the business sector, with young people, ensuring the inclusion of women, ensuring the inclusion of, of, of people from rur ur urban areas, and, and etc. Um, so well, this is a bit uh, what I what I wanted to say, um, and yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to finish this uh, this panel. I think it has been honestly very enlightening and very uh, stimulating to listen to all of you, all your different insights and, and ideas. Thank you to all of you, really, for your contribution. Uh, I know that we had like questions from social media and so on. Let's see if in the second panel there's time for the panelists to address like these questions. And before we end up like this session, uh, I give way to the closing remarks by the director of the Center for Contemporary Issues, Mr. Manel Manunellas. The floor is yours. Everybody for such an uh, interesting uh, debate. Uh, it was really exciting. And and uh, I could see it in the faces of some of the speakers and in my, my face uh, at the excitement for some of the topics which were addressed. And it's interesting because uh, it, it was such a polyedric approach, but at the same time, there were some points of agreement which were particularly interesting. I think that, that the central point of agreement with the different interventions here, it was that um, there is a need to ensure that the outputs of the summit clearly is in the framework of a real partnership between equals and that this uh, new relationship between Europe and Africa is not only presented an, uh, a reality of, uh, of uh, a partnership between equals, but it's also perceived as a such. And at, in parallel to that, uh, there was an agreement with all those who have been speaking uh, in this panel today on the importance of, on, on, on on reinforcing uh, African integration and reinforcing African integration at all levels, not only the continental one, which of course African Union is the most relevant one, but also at the regional level and the role that the European Union can play on that. Not in, in terms of duplicating the model of the European Union, as it has been said, but uh, uh, with the capacity of the European, European Union of enhancing uh, this integration at the regional and continental level in the African continent, which is crucial for the relationship between Europe and Africa, but also for the capacity of Africa uh, in, in overcoming some of the, the main challenges. And it was quite fascinating to see that uh, even if it was from very different perspective, there was agreement on that. And, and also very illuminating for me, you know, the debate about uh, what is the sense of keeping this uh, North African, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa relation between us, no? Because something we've seen from Barcelona. Well, maybe it's the first time I, I realize that it's also a debate within uh, the African continent. So I think that this was a very interesting um, uh, topic, which cross-cut all the interventions. And there was also another uh, other aspects which were there eh? for for the question. The need to ensure that uh, we move from uh, you know words to action, and and to action which is already taking place eh? because at least two or three people uh, commented the need to have a more integrated approach from the European side and uh, to keep a bit aside eh, the bilateral, bilateral mechanisms that sometimes for strategic issues may be easier from, for certain actors to activate. Eh? But uh, if there is a need to really reinforce this relationship, the relationship between equals has to be on the base of, of uh, integration from, from, from both sides. Again, of course, the question of pandemic and recovery was also a crucial one in almost all the interventions. And uh, the question of out African autonomy, and at least two people uh, again addressed the question that is not only about recovery, because the question of managing pandemic in the current situation in Africa, which is a continent which has less than 10% of, of vaccination, is going con and continue to be uh, a challenge, not only for African, but also for the neighbors, which includes which includes um, um, uh, Europe. So I think these were two of the three topics which, uh, in which there was a core agreement, but also there was a very strong call, which then it was uh, accepted by other uh, speakers about the need for a long-term vision uh, of, of the need that the EU is able to present and 
defend a long-term vision for Africa. And of course, the need that the African Union has uh, the same uh, approach uh, on that and that we keep aside reactive programs uh, to, to, to the programs of other players uh, for Africa. I think that this was also shared as it was, well, not that shared, but uh, at least from Barcelona, we want also to, to focus the, 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 the role that the Mediterranean and its institutions uh, can play on that. And again, um, two or three other topics to finish, which were also uh, commented by, by different of the actors. One, it was, of course, climate change. It's uh, dif multiple dimensions and implications from the security point of sight, but also from the, um, the role of the SDGs. Eh? It was also commented uh, at the particular role that SDGs could play as an accelerator on the road to low carbon economy uh, and, and the role that uh, Europe could help in, in, in enhancing that, taking into account also the different historical approaches and uh, historical roles that Africa and Europe has played in terms of, um, in terms of uh, climate change and carbon economy. And last but not least, of course, the, the role of youth uh, and, and this, uh, you know, sentence which also struck me, you know, why, this, why the youth we have to listen to the olders if we are 60%? Well, from a democratic point of view, I think it's, it's, it's quite a reasonable question to make. Eh? But I think that uh, here there is a, a shared uh, understanding that the question of youth, that the question of mobility, it's a crucial one. The question of multipolarity, multiplicity of actors, it's a crucial one. And also, as they recalled us from Rabat, uh, we have to be sure that we are talking about a demographic dividend and that this demographic dividend does not become a demographic time bomb. So I think, uh, and in order not to take too much uh, more time, because it was such an interesting debate that we could be here for a couple of more hours, uh, I think I tried to sum up some of the topics which really uh, clarified that uh, the, the, the summit that's going to take place tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, it's going to be a, an important one and that our leaders, they should be aware of the importance that this uh, uh, relationship uh, between the two continents is uh, at the core of uh, their objectives. Again, uh, thank you for, for all your thoughts and for sharing them. Uh, for those they don't know, we have asked the, the panelists of today if they have the time to do so to provide uh, us with some articles summarizing their interventions which we will include in our uh, magazine ideas so i think that uh, uh, this debate will not only be able to be you know follow up through your, the youtube channel because we will put it there for for the future but also in uh, a successive number of our magazine again thank you for that and thank you oscar for uh, taking the role in the moderation Thank you very much. I think we have to finish this panel. I've been told to say that we are going to have a 10, 15 minutes uh, coffee break, 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes break, and we'll be back therefore in 10 minutes. Thank you.
afternoon. After the coffee break, we continue with the second round table. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce and moderate the, the second round table on economic cooperation initiatives between Catalonia and Africa. When we started planning this event, from our Catalan perspective, it was clear that we wanted to include and embrace the business component and the business aspects as well. After all, our job at the Catalan representation is to strengthen and develop political and economic ties with our European and international partners. Our common initiatives in trade and investment are mutually beneficial. The Catalan government helps Catalan companies and their African counterparts find one another, work together, and thus contribute to economic growth, development, and ultimately the well-being of our citizens in both continents. Job creation is a very effective social policy. Of course, cooperation is a crucial aspect of the tasks of our Ministry of Foreign Action and Open Government, and our cooperation focuses especially on women, youth, and the most vulnerable. At the same time, we look at African countries as equal business partners. Our government adopted its Africa Plan in 2014, and the Catalan Agency for Competitiveness and Business, Axio, has four offices in the north, south, east, and west of Africa. Morocco, South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana. Let's get to know more about these business ties between Catalonia and Africa with concrete trade and investment examples by our distinguished panelists. I will start precisely for, uh, with someone from Axio, Ms. Nuria Juan. She's a senior consultant for Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa and South Asia at Axio. Thanks very much. Ms. Juan. Okay, thank you very much, Erika, for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation to be part of this interesting event. Uh, I don't know if do you have like the, the PowerPoint also to share with all the with all the people. Okay, perfect. Okay, so next next slide. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to share a quick snapshot about Catalonia uh, with a population of 7.7 .7 million people. Catalonia is a dynamic economy and an important industrial driver in Europe. Industry represents almost the 20% of Catalan GDP. We have a diversified industry with some top sectors such as chemicals and plastics, food and drinks, automotive and moto, life science or metallurgy, and also some emerging sectors poised for growth. Catalonia is also a hub of technology, innovation and entrepreneurship, and it's open to the world with more than 8,900 foreign companies and nine consecutive years of records of exports until 2019. Uh, next slide. Okay, so where are these exports and exchanges going to? Catalan exports are mainly concentrated in the European Union ahead of the rest of Europe and other regions. So in the last years, we've seen how the internationalization towards these other regions has increased a lot. This is the case of Africa, where the Catalan exports have grown almost a 62% in the last decade. SMEs and companies of Catalonia have a high commercial presence in the north of the continent, especially in Morocco and Algeria, and also Egypt. But in recent years, there has been a growing interest in sub-Saharan Africa. So if we focus in this region, the main destination of, of uh, countries are South Africa, followed by Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Senegal and Ghana. And the main products exported to Africa are electrical appliances and materials, plastics, machinery, fuels and oil. And if we look at the imports from Africa, we can see they also have grown by almost 15% in the last decade. So Catalonia imports mainly from Africa, fuels followed by electrical appliances and equipment and clothing. And some other interesting figures to share, um, we have at least 348 subsidiaries of Catalan companies in Africa, mainly based in Morocco, but also in other markets, and 33 African companies with presence in Catalonia. Just to share an example, mention the case of Aspen Pharmacare from South Africa, and finally, last year, more than 11,600 companies were exporting to Africa, of which more than 3,500 were exporting to Africa regularly. Does it mean in the last four and five years? 
So as we've seen, cooperation relations have grown exponentially in recent years, and one of our goals is to continue promoting these economic collaborations between Catalonia and Africa. And next slide. The other one, sorry. Okay. Perfect. So who we are and what we do? Uh, Axio, Catalonia Trade and Invest, is a Catalan government agency for foreign investment and business competitiveness. The agency, attached to the Ministry of Business and Knowledge, promotes business innovation and internationalization and also offers specialized one-stop shop services to international companies willing to invest in Barcelona and Catalonia. So one of the main actives of the agency is the international network of 40 offices worldwide covering more than 100 markets. Uh, next slide. So uh, which is our presence in Africa? Uh, we have offices in Casablanca and Johannesburg for over 25 years. So until 2014, we had presence in North of Africa and Southern Africa, but there was a very large gap of countries we were not covering and the interest in the region was increasing a lot. So in 2014, we've launched the African plan of the organization with the aim of increase the relations between Catalonia and the main economies of Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's why we've opened two new offices in West Africa and East Africa. So nowadays, uh, we cover a total number of 21 countries in the continent. From Casablanca, we cover Morocco. And from the other three offices, uh, we work mainly with Ghana, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Senegal, and Cameroon, but also Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, and Equatorial Guinea. From Nairobi, we work mainly in Kenya and Ethiopia, but also in Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda. And from Johannesburg, we're very focused in South Africa, but we are also covering Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, Botswana, and Zambia. So apart from our teams in these offices, we also have a great network of collaboration with local partners that are our eyes and in the, in the different markets. And Mono also would like to point out the Catalonia Trade <coughs> and Investment Offices in Brussels and Washington that have a strong expertise in the multilateral and European opportunities. And we collaborate a lot in different projects in the region in order to identify and pipeline projects supported by actors like World Bank, African Development Bank, or the European institutions. So from the different offices, uh, we can assist the Catalan ecosystem in their international projects in Africa at any stage and through tailor-made made services. Uh, we can assist companies in their initial steps in Africa through market studies, B2B agendas, or looking for partners in the region. And also we can support more advanced projects, assisting in the follow-up of strategic contacts, setting up a company or finding a person to recruit among other services. Uh, we can also help companies to access to international tenders and finding partners for innovative collaboration projects. So just to share some figures, since 2018, we've been involved in nearly 700 projects in Africa, a lot of them with the objective to find out a partner in the region. So as we, as we commented before, in Catalonia, we have a very diversified industry and the projects that we've been work, working with come from very different sectors. Uh, anyway, in generalizing, we can point out four major sectors that present interesting opportunities in Africa. Nuria, These are, Nuria do you hear me? Nuria. Yes. Yes, uh, si. uh, since we started late and we really don't have many minutes for each one, uh, yes. If you don't mind, you, if you can come up with an example on the second round, this general uh, presentation of Axio is very interesting, but we would uh, appreciate if you could uh, give us uh, some success stories like you, you mentioned in your, in your slide, but in the second yes. round, because you, now we really okay, need to don't go, go on. Thank you. Okay, uh, don't worry. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next is also to Axio, and she's also a woman. We are very pleased to, to give the floor to, to powerful women. It's uh, Florence Yard, director of the office of Axio in Accra, Ghana. Florence? in Africa. So I'm connected with you here from, from Accra uh, and I am the director of the West Africa and Central Africa office here to support connection between Catalan and West African and Central African ecosystem. So since we have very much time, uh, very little time, sorry, I wanted to focus the presentation 
application can put the, the, the PowerPoint in four main strategies that we observe and how uh, uh, we see the perspectives no, in uh, economic cooperation and uh, business and innovation relation between the African continent and Catalonia. So I, I don't see the PowerPoint. I don't know if you have put it. Yes. Okay. Can you start? Okay. You can go to the, to the next slide. So very briefly, uh, we are here in a context of growing opportunities for business uh, cooperation between Europe, Catalonia, and uh, Western Central Africa uh, for many factors. Uh, I will just uh, go through briefly. Uh, first of all, we are talking about countries with huge resources, uh, with a huge demographic pressure, very rapid uh, demographic growth. It's the continent of the youth, so the continent of the future, and also very important middle class and economic GDP growth rate. No? So in this context, uh, really, we find ourselves in uh, the need the African continent to connect uh, to uh, a technological partner, also to develop their industries and be able to uh, create jobs for this youth. No? In this context, as I was saying, we identify four strategies from the Catalan companies who enter in the region. The first strategy, uh, sorry, is the, the, the slide uh, before? Yes. The first strategy is the, the trade uh, relation. My colleague Nuria has explained here, just I want to really briefly um, distinguish that uh, we are working with uh, dual market till now. Okay, so we have on one side an open market and a very price sensitive market that uh, uh, targets for the low purchasing power of the economy. But on one side, on another side, a very fast growing uh, uh, modern distribution. And usually with the Catalan company, this is where they can be uh, competitive or find a niche market in these segments where uh, at the end targets for the middle class needs and where there is a need for um, quality and uh, maybe uh, they, that they can afford slightly more pricey uh, products. So we are seeing Catalan companies enter in this niche market growing from low volumes but uh, very, with a lot of consistency. Of course the cultural and geographical proximity and uh, the feasibility and cost are key uh, success story for export or import operation. Next slide please. The second strategy that I, I hadn't when I came here, but that is uh, we observe a growing interest, is the um, opportunity to invest and be closer to it. Now, the COVID pandemic has also urged the need to, to be closer to the local market, the local contacts, and therefore the importance of sourcing and exchanging on local talent. Next slide. The third strategy, finally, that we see for the Catalan company in West and Central Africa is the follow-up of funding movement. Uh, this area in the world is a clear receiver of international development funding, also for the achievement of the SDG. So we can identify uh, sovereign funding, so to the government, that uh, gives way to opportunity for participating to tenders with local partner. But what is interesting is also a boom of uh, investment and equity funds investing in the continent in the private sector, but backed up by multilateral or bilateral institution. And this, this is a very interesting tool for the Catalan company to enter in the understand who are the player, the value chain, and the companies and partner that they can contact in order to uh, target those opportunities together with the African partners and companies. Next slide. And to end my presentation, and this is mostly the, the strategy of the future, is the cooperation, technical know-how, transfer, and innovation strategy. This is basically the main uh, concern of the African uh, economies at the moment, is to uh, shift from being an exporter of cocoa, now for example, the Ivory Coast of Ghana, uh, to an industrial producer of chocolate. No? And for that, they will need uh, technical know-how, they will need technical cooperation, and uh, here in Catalonia and in, in Europe, for example, in Catalonia, there, there is a huge potential for agri-food technology, no? for example, the, but this technology needs to be adapted to the local context. So we are working a lot here in the office also to uh, source for, for grants and projects such as the Horizon uh, Europe, for example, to be able to finance those technical cooperation programs. And I will end with one example, if you can go to the final slide. 
So this is one example of one uh, success story that we have uh, developed it from the office. We have an industrial know-how exchange program with the Association of Ghana Industry since 2017, where we organize like contact points and B2B uh, to cross uh, cut uh, trends uh, between African experts uh, and African technologies and uh, Catalan technologies in the industrial area, such as smart packaging, zero waste industries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here, what we see as well is the huge potential, and I will end with this, of the continent to leapfrog, not to the latest technology available of, in the market and the interest to connect with those technologies without the need to pass through all the development steps that we've seen in the Western economy. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And here in Accra, we are available for any question for the assistance. Thank you, Florence. We now will give the floor to Mireia Gil who's founder of the cooperative Azimut 360. Mireia? Yes, hi, good afternoon. Yeah, I, I am, as, as Nuri introduced, I am one of the founding members of Azimut 360. Uh, I had a presentation, maybe um, it would be, if you can, okay, thank you. I will try to be, yeah, like fast. Um, Azimut 360 uh, is a cooperative of engineers. Uh, we are based in Barcelona, but we have uh, now 10 year experience working worldwide. Next slide, please. In particular, we have worked in more than 20 countries in the five, con in the five continents. Next slide, please. And when, you, we focus on Africa. As you can see, we have mainly uh, worked in North Africa, say Morocco, and then also West Africa. We are, uh, we are involved in renewable energy projects, but from different perspective, we can uh, install solar and grid tie and standalone systems. We are also very specialized on mini grids for rural electrification, and this can be done in the frame of tenders, but also development projects that ourselves we can conceive, formulate, and submit to multilateral um, institutions. We are also specialized on engineering and, cons and consultancy services, and we have a, a section of the cooperative dedicated to energy and health. So uh, we try to ensure um, the right to, to health through ensuring the right to access to electricity and to uh, solar medical oxygen solutions. Next slide, please. Here it's, uh, it's a little bit the, what I have I just said. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. okay. Now some examples of our work so that you can maybe uh, more like uh, understand better what we do. Uh, I try to put different uh, types of projects and also different uh, sources of, of funding so that you can see our areas of work. This is a, a project that is uh, founded by the Agencia Española de Cooperación al Desarrollo and it consists on improving the health um, access in, in, the, in the province of Shevchawin in Morocco. So, and we submitted this project, we formulated it and we intervene in, in different, different access, but our capacities go or capabilities go to improve the uh, energy access and also the access to oxygen. Next slide. Here is uh, our, this is uh, pictures from our assessment visit. Uh, this is an ongoing project that we are planning to finish within the next year. Next slide, please. A similar project we are now leading, and this one has been funded by the Agencia Catalana, the Cooperación de Desenvolupament, is uh, improving the health uh, access in a, in a health facility in Boaque, in the Ivory Coast. Next slide, please. And same principle, we will install um, um, a solar system to ensure 24 hours uh, electricity availability, as well as uh, systems to produce locally oxygen with solar power so that we can ensure oxygen, also the right to oxygen of the patients. Next slide, please. Okay, and a completely different project, but that we are also 
starting in, in Africa, uh, we have designed a modular plug and play solar uh, photovoltaic containerized solution with built in intelligence to improve the rural electrification projects in uh, especially focused in West Africa. And this has been done with a, in partnership with the Knost University in Kumasi, in Ghana. And next slide, please. And this is a, a solar system we installed uh, in Uganda. So it's almost 500 uh, kilowatts uh, in a research center in Uganda. This it is completely a private client. So as you see, we, are, we, we can work either with um, public funders and, and then in, uh, funders that promote innovation, but also uh, private clients. Next slide, please. This is a similar project, but with the same uh, research center in the Gambia, the medical research center, uh, same thing. Uh, we installed it was at that moment the biggest installation in the gambia grid tie installation in the gambia and it was done also uh, with an ongoing training to a local uh, association that that trains women to become um, energy uh, solar energy installers and designers next slide please and finally, this is one example of a rural electrification project. Here, we were responsible, we were part of the of the consortium executing the project, and and we did from the solar system to all the distribution lines to ensure uh, electricity access to, to more than eight hundred families in the northeast of the Ivory Coast. Next, I think this is the last one. Uh, this is a little bit what we do. So. I am open to questions. Thank you. For the examples where you, you uh, partnered with uh, businesses and, and research um, uh, entities in, in Africa. Our last uh, panelist of this first round is uh, Mr. Normal Albi, who is the CEO of the telecommunications company AFR IX Telecom. Uh, Normal? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Norman Albi. Sorry for the noise, but we are in, uh, in the middle of a trip, so we are trying to get a place where to get connected. Uh, as as we can say, we are Afrix Telecom, which is a telecommunications uh, provider in several countries in Europe, uh, Africa, and uh, US. Um, I don't know if you, I can share some slides, so you have to. The, the slide deck, which we will go uh, quite fast. I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, the name of the company is Afrix Telecom. We can go to the next one. There is something that we got, want to make a, a remark: is that uh, while in, we are used to, to broadband, we're used to internet, we're used to use a lot of services online in Europe or when. In, or in the States, or in Japan, or in South America, but uh, where we have high rates of penetration of, of internet, 80, 90, sometimes 100, depending on the country. But if we look at Africa, we are talking about uh, numbers of 56% in North African countries and 26% in Central African countries. So it means that uh, there is a, a really mass uh, a massive number of people that need to come online on the broadband area, and that uh, today they are not integrated in the, into that uh, that process, and they might be using some applications, but uh, they are not using properly the, all the applications that uh, that uh, in some of the places of, the, of the parts of the world uh, world we have the opportunity to use. So can we go to the next one? Well, this is, uh, as we can say, uh, uh, some statistics, but we can take the ITU, we can take some other ones, and you see uh, the, the location of some African countries, and I would say these are the top countries, that which are 45 to 50%. Uh, uh, well, in, in Northern Africa, the numbers are higher. Can we go to the next one? Okay. Uh, we are uh, an operator that will interconnect Africa to Europe and Africa to Africa. 
So we use quite a lot of, of interconnections that, of course, in Africa, they need to be subsea, because we interconnect Europe to Africa via subsea. Uh, we have 16 submarine, or we can use up to 16 submarine cables between the two continents. And there was a, a, a report from the World Bank that uh, uh, what they say is that in to, to reach uh, similar numbers to, of the penetration that, that we have in, in, in Europe, in Africa, we need uh, quite a large number of investment. Some people, they say up to 100, or the World Bank was estimating up to 100 billion. Uh, US billion in this case. So uh, we say that it's a, it's a large investment, the one that needs to be done in infrastructures and services. Can we go to the next one, please? Well, at the same time, when we are talking about uh, what the skills, uh, mm, we, we are working uh, with uh, uh, African teams. Uh, I would say that 50% uh, of our company is African uh, people. So all the companies in Africa are managed by African uh, based uh, professionals that we have been hired in the companies where we, we have presence in Africa, I'll show you later on. And 50% uh, of the people is, uh, is uh, uh, from outside of Africa origins, but they are mainly based on, on Europe or they are supporting the African operations. Uh, when, when when it's needed, but they are not based in, in Africa. Can we go to the next one, please? Okay, this is a little bit of the service we provide. Next one. So, uh, as we said, 49% of our uh, team is in Africa. 33% of our team is originally from Mr. Albi, excuse what? me, but we, we hear really a lot, of, a lot of noise in the background. Yeah, it's possible. Um, yeah, it's possible. It, if you can move to a more quiet place, a quieter place, uh, that would be great. Um, okay, not easy. Huh? What you're asking me is not easy, but uh, we can try. Okay, one second. We will, uh, we will maybe in okay. the second round go back to yeah. you. Yeah, I think it's much better. So then I can change the location in the meantime. Okay. In a few minutes and. We Thank can you. ask. Uh, we can start now uh, a round of, of questions, which will be handled by our representative to the European Union, who will also pronounce the closing remarks. I would, I would like to know if uh, there is in here in the here uh, in the public there is uh, any question for the for the speakers. If if not, I will give the floor to the uh, to the speakers to make a second intervention, intervention starting by Nuria Juan. Please, Nuria. Okay, thanks a lot and sorry because I ran a little bit out of time before. So just to mention some examples of projects we've been working with. Uh, just mention, for example, the case of a Catalan company specialized in the engineering, design and manufacturing of pieces for, to different industries. So we've helped them in the registration of an office in Johannesburg. They've created a small local team and also we've organized them like B2B agendas with the strategic players in West and East Africa. Uh, for example, this year also we've been working with a healthcare company uh, specialized in medical nutrition products and they've just signed an agreement with an important player in Ethiopia. And in the agritech sector, for example, uh, during 2019 and last year, we participated from the four African offices in an inverse mission where we were inviting players of the agritech sector from Ghana, Morocco, South Africa, Kenya and Ethiopia to have B2B meetings with Catalan companies specialized in the sector. Uh, these editions were very successful and this year we are going to repeat this activity in the food processing sector. Uh, and also, we can support the African players who are in touch with. So uh, we can help African companies to find a supplier, a manufacturer partner, a technology, a technology provider, or also a suitable company matching their specific needs. Just to share some examples, uh, share with you the case of Edric Group, 
a company from Ghana that found Catalan partners in the furnishing and decoration industry. We've prepared for them a B2B agenda and they've visited different companies during their trip in Barcelona. Or the case of Edlin International, a South African company specialized in meat and other agri-food products. They were interested in contacting suppliers of functional ingredients and we've introduced them different companies. So both cases are already doing business with some of these Catalan companies. Uh, we also can assist the African players in the search of technological partners for their projects. As an example, our office in Accra have been in touch with a research center in Nigeria that was interested in the partners' identification to develop together food products of high nutritional value. Also, from our Johannesburg office, they've been in touch with a South African company that specializes in insect protein for animal feed and we're keen to find a partner in Barcelona who could assist them in their R&D projects in order to qualify for the Eurostars funding program. And of course, we also can assist in the full process of companies that want to invest in Barcelona and Catalonia. As an example, uh, from our Nairobi office, we've been in touch with a Kenyan company that offers a platform for fresh food producers and they were considering Barcelona as a great option to open an office in, South, in Southern Europe and find talent. So these are just some few examples to put on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Nuria, and thanks for the concrete examples. Eh? that uh, we are asking for. And the floor is for uh, Florence Iar. Yes. Sorry, I cannot hear you. The floor is yours. Yes. Okay. So uh, the question we wanted to to address uh, was okay among the the four strategies that I have briefly introduced to you. What was how how can the Catalan company choose like the right one and which one uh, will be the the most uh, let's say uh, interesting for future perspective? No. Uh, what we see uh, more and more is uh, uh, coming back to the, the need for, for, for technology transfer for industry. No? And I would like specifically to take the example of, uh, of the agri-food industry, uh, how to solve a uh, uh, conservation problem for tomato, how to uh, improve the packaging solution. No? In there, um, really, uh, there is a huge potential for uh, cooperation and technical cooperation between uh, Europe European Catalan companies and, and West African companies. We have, for example, um, in the Horizon Europe uh, program, there were like more than 30 programs where Africa was considered as a priority to develop new research and development solutions, but also solutions that are closer to the market, but need to be adapted to the local African context. And gradually we see uh, somehow a shift now from uh, an export uh, relationship where uh, there is a company who wants to export their products, their services, or, or the opposite, import products or services to a technology transfer optic um, in this direction uh, to uh, strengthen um, the industry. But it can also be uh, in energy, in the environment, and also lately with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a lot of uh, interesting projects in the health sector. Um, but ICT can, is also an example, fintech, etc., etc. Thank you, Florence. And now is the floor is for uh, Mireya Gil. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, is are we in the question section or? For the successful projects, we have uh, yeah, several. I I have uh, explained the uh, one of the I would say most representative projects of uh, that we are developing now. Um, go go forward with that. Go ahead with that samples. But I have already explained them in the previous section. Yeah. Questions. So now, now it's time to for questions. Question for Nuria: If you had to share one key success factor for Catalan companies in Africa, which one will be it? 
would it be? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so in our experience, if, if I had to choose one, I will focus like on the three P's that are like presence, perseverance and patience. It's very important to be present and to travel and know the markets you want to work with. It's crucial uh, to understand the market, its environment, and adapt the products or solutions uh, in case it's needed. And now with the COVID situation, we all experience it like a push to the virtuality and most part of the companies have been adapted to this new situation. And in fact, we had some also success cases of Catalan companies closing orders from African players by WhatsApp, but it's not the same. It's important to travel and to understand the market. The partner selection and developing a long-term relation, it's also a very uh, crucial aspect. It's very important to build a personal and trusting relationship with your partner in Africa. So if you can travel often, we recommend companies to call the contacts or to send them periodically WhatsApps rather than sending emails. So this informal bond can make the, the difference. And also the follow-up, it's a must. It's not a region for one visit. So we've seen companies that are not being successful because of the lack of follow-up. So again, uh, the important thing to develop a long-term relation and to invest resources to this end. Thank you, Nuria. Now for okay. Florence, uh, you have described several strategies followed by the Catalan business ecosystem for economic cooperation in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, in particular to, for trade, investment, and innovation, innovation aspects. How can the company select the right strategy and which strategy will have more perspective for the future of the continent, in your opinion? Yes, sure. So, as I, I was mentioning before, um, it depends on what the what the companies wants uh, wants to do. Usually, the companies that want to start the relationship with the continent start with a, a an export based strategy because they want to test the market. They want to see if their solution uh, can fit. So there is a need for to do a, a study. There is a need to study as well uh, how competitive can the the company be and in which market segment. They can they can work no. Uh, secondly, the, the next step will be for the company to uh, really take the decision to uh, register a company in the market. We don't have so so many cases uh, here. Norman with us is uh, one of uh, I think the companies with most uh, subsidiaries no in the in the continent. But we see that in the future it will be more and more necessary to be present and as well to capitalize on the local talent and as well hybrid talent to be close to the markets uh, because the markets are huge and it's difficult sometimes to manage them from, uh, from abroad. And then finally, um, uh, as I said, the, the, the technology transfer and innovation program that for me is uh, the strategy uh, uh, that will be more and more present in the future. Um, there is the need as well, uh, because one of the barriers we find in those markets is the access to funding no, from, the, from the counterpart. So this is why it's very crucial as well for the companies to understand where this funding is coming from and how uh, they can uh, capitalize on this funding to uh, make those projects uh, realities. You know? Because here, a big barrier, for example, in Ghana, um, if we are talking about in industrial expansion projects and the company has to go to ask for a loan at the bank, we are talking about 25% interest rate. You know? So it's a, it's a, it can be a big challenge for the company, for example, to work on a new pilot uh, for packaging machine or to develop new recipes or new formula formulation because the funding um, is, uh, is lacking or is difficult to, to access. So it's very important to triangulate uh, the cooperation project with the offer of the funding available. The funding is available, as I said, or either through sovereign ways or non-sovereign ways, but it's a matter of identifying it and also identifying the value chain and how it is distributed or capitalized in the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. And now uh, for Mireya, what have been the key success factors for your internalization in sub saharan Africa? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I have been a little bit like uh, well, uh, doing reflections about that. The first thing, uh, we started as a consultancy company. We didn't start business in Africa like doing infrastructure projects. So we started doing consultancy, which has less risk. And then we learned how we could move 
uh, stakeholders in every country. Uh, we met partners and etc. And then you 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 learn how to I don't know how to deal with uh, with the local environment. I know that uh, we tend to generalize, but West Africa is quite similar. Um, and you start uh, knowing the traps. So uh, by the time we we had developed like models to reply to tenders and etc., we already knew those traps, and we were quite uh, more ready to to work in infrastructure projects. And then another very key point for us is having local partners. We have never thought of uh, opening a delegation in Africa, but we have rather work with local partners in either of the countries. There is no project in, without any um, local partner. And also, uh, we started uh, four years ago an inter, uh, intercooperation project. I, I think it's all, it was also a good point with uh, Iwasol, which is another cooperative from here. Um, they had their contacts in other countries. And since we started this uh, this cooperation, we, we have now a long-term agreement with UNDP. And we have uh, worked in eight countries, eight different countries for a half million euro business in consultancy. And I and lately as well, <laughs> the services from Florence uh, in 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 Accra that helps us identify uh, it, it make things easier, like both from uh, identifying partners and also identifying calls and identifying potential business opportunities. I would say thank this you. is the most. Thank you, Mireya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mireya. Same, same question for Norman. Uh, just to say, what has been the key success factors in your internalization uh, process in Sub-Saharan Africa? And also, what can you say about the African market in the digital domain? Okay, uh, first one is Africa is 54 countries. Uh, multural, <laughs> a, a large number of cultures and a large number of, uh, of activities. So uh, it's, it's what works in one country doesn't work in the other one. Okay, so we have been successful in some countries. We have not been successful in some other countries. But uh, uh, what I would like to, to say is that partnering with a, a, a local uh, investment uh, or a local business people in, in the country is one of the key of success. You cannot go alone to one of the countries, at least for us, because this is uh, this will not make the, the business grow. As we say, um, we have to be there for forever. So when we make an investment in Africa, we're going to be there for the next uh, 20 years, 25 years. So we are not going there for five years. We have to have uh, an organization that is stable on that. And for me, this is identifying the right people to partner with in the country and the right people that uh, will be part of your team in that country is the key factor to the success. The second one is the structure of the market in that given country. We are talking about 54 different countries, so the dimension of the economies are very small in some cases, are very diversified, and, and uh, some in some countries uh, um, the market might be too small or the market might be too protected. So it's very good to. Uh, to analyze exactly the countries where you want to be present. So I would say that this is the, the two key uh, aspects of, of, of the experience, of our experience. Thank you, Norman. Probably Norman uh, was trying to say or to shape uh, for us that uh, Africa is a very noisy continent as well. I know that, that is a very bad joke, but anyway. Uh, Nuria, a second question for you. For the companies that are considering to start working working with Africa, which factors uh, can be useful in order to define the market prioritization in the continent?
Your sound is mute, Nuria. Sorry, now I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So I was saying that uh, I completely agree with the comments uh, on Norm of Norman. Uh, we are talking about a very heterogeneous continent with very different areas and realities coexisting together. So it's quite challenging to decide where to start in the continent. Anyway, uh, there are some tips that can be useful in this decision making. So it's important to analyze the internal experience and resources in order to decide which is the most suitable market to start working with. The decision can be different uh, for a company with a large international experience than for a company that is starting its international adventure. Another factor to consider is the language. We can be more comfortable working with English speaking countries or maybe uh, some companies prefer to focus in French or Portuguese speaking countries. So some actions that we also can do if we, if we offer products is explore the HSS codes and exchange of movements of the different African countries. It can be a useful guide to see which are the countries that are importing more this kind of offer and also to get some information about which African countries also have an industry if they are already exporting these codes. Also, for service-based companies uh, that are used to tender, it can be uh, a good idea to do a, a pipeline of projects to see where the multilateral, bilateral, and government opportunities are focusing its efforts. For example, if we enter to the website of the African Development Bank, we can see which are the priority sectors and also which countries are receiving more support. So depending on the product or service uh, offered by the company and the goal, uh, the prioritization strategy can be very different. But in general terms, uh, we can point out also some markets that can act in many occasions as an entry platform to the different regions, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa. So Ghana can be a great hub for the English-speaking Western African countries. Uh, Ivory Coast and Senegal can act as the entry platform for the French-speaking countries. In Central Africa, also Cameroon can be an interesting hub for the region. Uh, in East Africa, Kenya can be also a regional hub for the countries of the East African community. And in South Africa, uh, in, in, in the Southern African region, South Africa can be also a great gateway to start with. So with this in mind and analyzing statistical criteria and consumption habits, uh, a list of priority countries can be done considering language preferences, monetary, cultural, customs, and other legislative barriers of each country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nuria. And now uh, I've been told there is a question from the public. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for um, this um, great uh, introduction to your work and, and uh, the work of the, of the Ministry of, of Catalonia. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first one to Norman. Um, I would like to um, maybe understand if you could elaborate uh, on the, on which has been the the um, main difficulty in bridging the gap between um, maybe the the culture of work in Europe and the culture of work in Africa. Because I know that like uh, many enterprises that are in Africa do not uh, hire. Um, um, locals. This is one of uh, a great c critique, maybe that that has been ongoing, and it's very interesting what you said that like um, I think 60% of of your of your workers are. So I think it's 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 quite interesting to understand that part. And the second uh, question goes uh, more um, to Axio um, um, on whether like uh, in in your plans you are targeting these um, the the for example the innovation hubs that are very present in Nigeria and a lot with a lot of uh, young people. Well, at, at the end to understand like um, uh, if you have any uh, kind of perspective towards um, youth and and the youth innovators, change makers, and entrepreneurs on the continent. Thank you. Thank. You. Okay, maybe I can take the first uh, answer. Uh, there is a change of uh, of uh, I would say a little bit of culture that uh, as a company you have to do. The first one is that uh, we are used to some processes in Europe that we give them, we understand them as automatic, as given, you know? And in Africa, uh, they are not by given. Things that doesn't happen if, uh, as, uh, as we expect them to happen. Uh, so there should be uh, a learning by the European 
company uh, to work in Africa because maybe we expect things from them and they don't understand that we expect them that things to happen or the people to 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 do or to behave in one way that maybe is the standard way in 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 Europe. Sorry for the noise, but it's very difficult to find a place that uh, that uh, is not noisy at this time. Uh, so that's for me. This is the key of learning how how we can do the things. Okay. Uh, identifying the key people is the most difficult part. Okay, because identifying who can who can join your company, if if it's people from Africa that they have been working overseas this makes things easier but if they are people that uh, they they have been only working in the country then uh, they will be missing a lot of references because they have not had the opportunity to have the same inputs as we had and and then we have to bridge this gap and it's not their fault it's uh, our fault because we we need to, uh, to i mean we don't need to expect something that is not going to happen we need to uh, go together with them and, and, t and, and train our people and train them. So for me, uh, these are the two secrets that makes the possibility to success. I'm sorry for the noise, huh? but uh, it's impossible to find any other place. Second question for, uh, was for Akshio. Your, your sound is mute, Florence. Uh, okay, now? Hello, hello? Yes? It's okay. It's okay, yes. Okay, so I, I think if I understood the, the question properly, uh, you were asking about Axio perspective for uh, innovation hubs and young people, right? Uh, so yeah, so basically uh, we uh, we are working uh, here, um, and we had as well the pleasure to receive actually a delegation from from Ghana, from NIP and the Ministry for Business Development, to uh, try to uh, also encourage uh, exchange between startups, uh, incubators, ecosystem between West Africa and uh, Catalonia. So in those cases uh, as well, we have worked uh, together in several calls that are trying to encourage uh, cooperation between both ecosystems to try to link uh, ecosystem of startups in um, in uh, in this case in Ghana and in Nigeria, for example, with the network as well Impact Hub and uh, ecosystem of startups in Catalonia and uh, Ghana. The the program as well Enrich, which is a European Union program, is one of those examples. So um, we have also contact. Uh, you were asking for initiative from the young. No, the uh, there is the youth network uh, here in Ghana as well, who, which ha who has approached us. Uh, because they are also forming uh, incubators and um, they are trying to link or to connect with uh, technologies and as well uh, attraction of funding best practices now how to um, to, to uh, source for business angels or how as well to uh, get help uh, in technological support so in this case we have also uh, opened a project in that sense to to try uh, to connect uh, both uh, both ecosystems. Mostly, is through as well um, European projects or multilateral uh, funded projects. So we try to uh, include those uh, those cooperation between the two ecosystems in the framework of those projects. I don't know if this answers your question. Otherwise, don't hesitate to to develop more. Yeah, you answer. Uh, and as, as you can see, more much better when we go to concrete cases and uh, and, and, and your experiences. Um, unfortunately, there is no time left for more questions. But let me be a little bit disruptive and make a question to all of you. Imagine you are tomorrow in Brussels. Imagine you have in front of you all the leaders attending the summit, uh, the Europe-Africa summit. Uh, can you tell me, each of you, each of you one, one proposal, one question, one proposal you, you, you can uh, make to these leaders in order to improve 
uh, the economic uh, possibilities and uh, opportunities, both for the companies or, or your companies or, and the countries. Who first? Okay, so I start. So yeah, it's a difficult question, but maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, my recommendation, uh, well, yeah, my recommendation would be to try to accompany all these priorities that these days are going to take place. No, there, there are going to be a lot of thematic roundtables about private sector support, different topics like health systems, agriculture, sustainable development, climate change, energy transition that are really interesting and are really linked also with some sector priorities from our organization. But I will say that it will be interesting to try to accompany all these priorities with the strategic tools that promote and enhance the European and African cooperation. I don't know, as an example, eh, we used to have very interesting instruments uh, like the Innovate program that was very useful for technological transfer cooperation uh, and also different exchange talent programs for R&D projects like TechnoSprint. So I would say to, to try to promote and enhance uh, this kind of, uh, of really strategic and important tools to, to develop and continue uh, working together with more uh, facilities. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Nuria. Florence? Yeah, so to continue a little bit as well in this line, I would uh, probably recommend um, some, um, some program that uh, can uh, support uh, technology transfer, but closer to the market, because a big need that we see is um, there is a technological uh, need but uh, there is also uh, the, the need for this solution to be adapted to the local context. As Norman said, this uh, 54 countries, so each country sector and even surroundings uh, need to have their own solution uh, to, the, to the problems that they face in, in their ecosystem. So I think um, a pilot uh, program needs to be put in place to enhance this technological cooperation between uh, European uh, innovation and business ecosystem and African uh, ecosystem. And probably I would prioritize uh, the agri-food industry. Thank you, Florence. And now Mireya. Yes, um, yeah, from my side, uh, as I am involved in rural electrification projects, I will ask, I would ask please to bring down all these budgets to the population because sometimes they, they launch programs, they launch calls where uh, they favoritize big investments, but then it is difficult to make big investments in Africa that are uh, financially interesting. So in the line a little bit that on, on with what Florence was saying, uh, to like touch base and see the reality, especially in Africa, there are 600 million people without access to electricity in Africa. So the market is huge, but then uh, the calls not, are not always adapted to these needs. So I would ask them to uh, like, to make sure that all these investments, uh, all these uh, mechanisms and instruments are appropriate to make uh, available the energy access for the population, especially in rural Africa. Thank you, Mireya. And um, finally, Norman? Yes, unfortunately, access is fine. Did, did you hear the question? Imagine you have the leaders in front of you, the leaders of the summit uh, Europe Africa, and you have a question time, and uh, you can make a question. Well, what will you recommend uh, to the leaders uh, to be implemented in, uh, in their countries in order to improve the, the economic possibilities and, and so on uh, in their countries, and for the people as well, and for your companies? It's a pity, it's a pity, but uh, okay. I think I think the contribution was very very interesting. Can you hear me, Norman? 
Sorry, I, I lost uh, the connection for one second. Yes, please. Uh, did, you, did you hear the question? No. I, well, well, if we had the leaders well, we, in front of us, what would uh, we yeah, be yeah, asking yeah. them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same question yes. for all of you. Yes. What I will be asking them is to make the things easy. Okay? We don't need to teach the African how to do things. We don't need to, to give... I mean, we have to provide them uh, uh, capital resources. But for me, the most difficulty is all the barriers that we have to cross every day and that are affecting the daily African lives. Okay? Uh, if we could have a single currency in the continent or a very way to 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 end within the country, be perfect. Uh, I have to pay one service from Nigeria and to going to Burkina Faso, and I have to go to the dollar or to the euro. Sorry, somebody can explain me why I have to do this. I cannot pay directly in in from one African currency to another one. Okay. I have to go through a hard currency that the countries they don't have, and this is preventing even the, the development. Then we have customs, okay, we have trade agreements, and we have a large trade agreement that is going to come in place, but finally, the reality is that we have customs, okay, which are stopping all the processes, but I understand that the African countries, they need the customs to get the, the money. Okay, it's a source of revenues and they don't get taxes in another place. So, uh, the, in Africa needs to be a transformation, so things become easy, barriers become easier, and then people, they can grow, they can access to bigger market, they can easily transfer uh, and, and make cross-border transactions cheaper, uh, easier. So, similar to what we have had with the European Union, but at a large case, with, uh, in terms of currency, in terms of laws, in terms of regulations, and in terms of this is what uh, what uh, we all need, I think, in Africa. And then we can do a lot of things. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Norman. Thank you, uh, Nuria, Florence, Mireya, for your contributions. And I hope you, uh, to see you soon in Brussels. Yes, uh, hopefully, yes. Hopefully, yeah. After thank the you. pandemic. OK. <laughs> thank you. So thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Uh, OK. Uh, before moving to the final words, uh, I would like to, to express my personal gratitude to Mrs. Monsa Vilalta, which is uh, who is the director general of our foreign action department for your presence here and now uh, yes we are going to finish uh, i would like to thank again all the speakers who have participated in in this event uh, all their inputs and contributions as academics public servants and business representatives have been extremely important to put uh, the africa europe partnership into perspective as we have seen today, the relationship between Africa and Europe has many sides, as it encompasses a wide range of areas such as sustainable development, trade and investment, migration, people-to-people -people contacts, security, peace, and youth people <laughs> contribution as well. Eh? Uh, Congratulations for your inter intervention, by the way. All of them are challenges that we have to face, and also they are big opportunities that need a joint response. In Catalonia, we believe, we do believe that this response needs to bring Europe and Africa closer and set up the basics of shared prosperity. We hope tomorrow's summit tomorrow, to, after tomorrow's summit, will be a step on this direction. If you want to continue exploring this exciting topic, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the dossier, the magazine IDEA, New South and La Puerta de Africa. Um, and that's all. 
uh, if you are interested in, in Catalonia trade and investment action in Africa and the renewable energy and ICT initiatives from Africa and X Telecom and Asimut or the, um, the respective web page, you can find uh, more information. So thank you very much for your attendance and thank you very much to, to those who have been following this event online in YouTube. Thank you very much.